Well, this is a piece of poplar that I've turned into a model of an interior door. This is the interior jam set, and it's dadoed into the sides, a lot like the window frame that we did earlier. This piece on the bottom wouldn't be on a real door, but I put it on here to hold this frame rigid. On the real door, I'll replace this with a spreader that'll hold the jam sides apart. This is the inside stop, and the distance from here to here is the same thickness as the thickness of the door. But on this side, this stop is set back an additional 1 16th of an inch, greater than the thickness of the door. And that's to prevent this edge from binding when the door is closed. But as you see, this door won't close, and it's for a different reason. This edge is square, and it needs to be beveled. Doors swing on an arc, and the center of the arc is the center of the hinge pin. I'll use my divider to demonstrate. I'll put one leg of the divider right on the center of the hinge pin and the other leg on the edge of the door. And when I swing it, you can see that part of the arc. That's how you find the amount of bevel, but usually three to five degrees would be enough. Well, here's the required bevel, and I'll scribe a line all the way down the edge. I like to use old hand planes. This one's nice and sharp, and when I start, I'll only be making a narrow cut on the one side and it'll get wider as I go along. I use my hand against the edge to guide it with, and you see I lift the plane on the return stroke, only putting pressure on the forward stroke. Otherwise, you'll dull the iron. Okay, that looks good. And the margins look good. The margins should be equal all the way around. In the old days, they used to call it nickel and dime. That means that they used a dime for a thickness gauge on the hinge side and a nickel on the latch side. And I use a nickel across the top. Now this door is a little bit greater than that, and that's because it's winter and the door is contracted. In the summertime, it'll be tight. So if you fit your doors in the winter, make this a loose nickel. In the summer, make it tight. Sometimes these margins can be closed by paint buildup. And if you have to reduce the size of the door, take it off of the hinge side and then reset the hinges. You can see that the mortise for this hinge leaves the surface flush with the edge of the door. And I've left about 3 16ths of an inch here. And that lets the barrel of the hinge project out beyond the face of the jam so that the trim will fit. Well, here's something else about hinges. Hinges are bent, and that's called swaging, so that when the leaves are closed, they'll be parallel. Here's the diamond here again, and that's a parallel joint, but they're not always like that. You need to check your hinges to check the swage, because you might have to make this mortise a little deep or a little shallow to control the margin on the side. Well, there's another way to change this margin, and that's called throwing the hinge. You can shim behind the hinge leaf and that will move, move the door either this way or that way. But I'll tell you a lot more about throwing the hinge on the next doors that I'll hang. Whenever I can, I like to use my old hand tools that I was taught with. This is a joiner plane, my hand saws, which are sometimes faster than a skill saw, a jack plane, some specialty markers, and specialty planes. But the next door is going to be done in production basis, and so I use the electric ones, a router, electric plane, skill saw and drill. And now I'll get right to it. Here we are back on the inside of the house. This is the 2x4 wall with the half inch drywall on the sides. This is the jam set and the hollow core interior door. A lot of people use pre-hung doors and so do I, but I'd rather hang them in place. When I do that, I have to keep the time up and I'll have to use all the shortcuts I can. The first thing you need to do is measure the door. And this one is 30 inches. It's important to do that because a lot of them come downsized from the factory. Next is to cut the head, and I'll cut it 30 inches long, plus the depth of the two dados. Well, here's a handy way to make that measurement. Use your combination square as a depth gauge, and that's 3 8 After the head is cut the length, just nail the sides together. Six penny nails would be good enough. Three on each side will hold it. Well, door hanging is usually a one-man job. When you work by yourself, you learn to do a lot of tricks and shortcuts. 
I'll just take a shim shingle and nail it on the surface of the wall here. When the door jam goes in place, that'll be sure that it's flush with the surface of the wall. This way, I can concentrate on the bottom and the top will hold itself. This piece of wood is the spreader and it holds the bottom of the jam 30 inches apart, exactly the same as it is on the top. Put some shim shingles in there to snug it up. There doesn't have to be perfect right now because it's going to have to be adjusted when you plumb the sides. Put the level across the top and make it just as level as you can get it. When I level this head, it raises the one end up. That makes a space on the floor. And since this is a finished floor, you want that to be flush. So you take a scriber and set it to this distance and transfer it to the other side. That needs to be cut off, so you need to take the jam out and put it on the bench. So when you put it back in place, both sides will be down on the floor and the head will be level. Now I'll mark the center of the door. This is 15 inches because it's a 30 inch opening. And now to be sure I get the same thing on the spreader, I'll put the spreader in place and then mark it. Square that across. I'll use this for the plumb bob. I use a four penny finish nail just to the side of the mark. Then when the string goes on, it covers the center line of the mark. You want to be accurate, and that does it. Just wrap the string around itself and hold it in place. You need to shift this over until it comes right in. That looks good. Snug up the other side. Be sure and always check it to make sure it lines up with the drywall. And then nail it up. I use two 8 penny finish nails at each shim location and again set them about 1 16th of an inch deep. Use five sets of shingles on each side. One the top and bottom, one right in the middle, and then a set between those. Later on I'll come back and be sure there are shingles behind the hinges and also between the latch plate on the other side. The other side is bowed in. I'll hold a straight edge with my knee. It'll free both hands and then I'll shim it and bring it right to line. Be sure to cut this off just below the surface so it'll be out of the way of the trim. If you can't cut it with a sharp utility knife, saw it off with a handsaw. Well that's how I go about setting an interior jam. And I use a plumb bob because it's fast and accurate. But you could also use a straight edge like this one. This has parallel sides, and I have a little block, one on the top and one on the bottom. Just put this against the jam side like that, and you can use any size level to check it with. When it's plumb, just flip it around. Use the straight edge for shimming. Now since this, this is just one door, I'll work on the door next, but if I had a whole house full of doors, I'd do everything in sequence. Set every jam and every door opening, come back and fit each door, come back again and hinge. Now I'll put the stops on and I'll be ready to cut this door. I'll set my square to the thickness of the door and this is one and three eighths. Then I'll scribe a line down the jam. Now on the hinge side, I'll gain a sixteenth.
The top piece of the stop is a square cut and is just pressure fit. And this is the side piece, and this is a cope joint. I like cope joints better than miters because it makes a nice tight joint. And one way to be sure that it's tight, put a little wedge on the bottom. I'll just tack this up for now, and when the door is in place, I might have to adjust it. All right, that takes care of the jam. Now I cut this for a 30 inch door, cut the head 30 inches because it's a 30 inch door. And I've saved myself a lot of trouble by making the jam side straight. This will be the hinge side and I'll mark it so I won't lose it. And then I'll need to cut these margins for the nickel and dime and I'll bevel it at the same time. But before I do that, I'll put my router template on here and route out for the hinges. Well, I made this template for doors that only need two hinges, top and bottom. But you can make one for three hinges or heavy doors, even sometimes use four. First you cut the perimeter of the hinge and then clean out the middle. This is a homemade router template and it's right tight here on the top and I'll show you how to make one of those in just a few minutes. The router bit leaves a round corner and I'm using square cornered hinges. So first of all I'll cut away the fuzz and then cut across the grain and with the grain so that it doesn't split. And I just pare out the corners. Now that the hinges are located, I can back them up with more shims. Well, this is a door bench, and it's made out of framing lumber, and it's really easy to make. It has a stop here across the top. That'll hold the door in place, and you can adjust it for the door thickness. These rails across the bottom are adjustable, so you can use different sized doors. There's a compartment on each end, and it's lower than the top, so your tools will be out of the way. It's a plywood bottom, which makes the frame more rigid, and it's open on the end, so you can sweep out all the sawdust and debris. The middle compartment is for you. You just climb in there and grab the rails and walk away with it. The bench is only 22 inches wide, so it'll go through a narrow door. When you want to work on the top of the door, or cut it off, just pick it up and put it across the top. This is the top of the door, and there's my hinge mark so I wouldn't forget. And this template is reversible. Part that I have here on the top of the door was on the bottom of the jam. And here's my nickel spacing. Well, this is how this hinge template works. This is called a template guide, and it's bigger than this half inch bit. You make your cutout pattern, and that fits through there like that. You follow the outline, and the bit does the cutting. Well, cutting this mortise is just the same as it is in a jam, except here I have the advantage of gravity. Cut around the outside, then I clean out the center. Check it for flush. Square the corners again. This end is fragile, so be careful. And now mark the location of the screws. And then punch them with a nail set just off center towards the closed side.
Well, oh, need to tighten that a little bit. You should always drill pilot holes for screws, especially in dense wood like this, so the screws won't split it out. When these screws are off center, you'll pull it nice and tight to the closed end. Well, this is the template guide that I used earlier, but I'll show you how to make one for yourself. This is a piece of half inch plywood with a cutout, and this cutout is the shape of the hinge. And I arrive at the size by taking the hinge, and I use this space, which is the same as from the outside of the bit to the outside of the guide. Now, I only need to worry about this size at the moment. This can be wider, and I'll show you why in just a minute. First, I'll lay out the hinge on the door. I use five inches here because it holds the door better, but five, six, and seven inches are also a standard. You wouldn't want this, and this isn't neat either. You should have a closed mortise, and also that'll keep the hinge pin away from the trim on the edge of the door. I'll start by putting the template over the layout on the door and judging equal margins. Not like that, but right there. Put a nail in it to hold it there until you put the strip on. Same thing on the bottom. Well, this is a piece of three-quarter square pine, and I'll use it for a connecting strip. Put a couple of spots of glue on. Put it in place and hold it there with drywall screws. Same thing on the bottom. Well, this template is exactly the same as the one on the top. This is five inches from here to the hinge. The only difference is on the bottom hinge, it's ten inches from the bottom of the door to the finished cut of the hinge. I'll tell you more about that in the booklet. Well, this electric plane is about 25 years old, but it still works really well. It has an adjustable fence. I'll check the square and then set the bevel by eye. It's about 5 degrees. Make a series of cuts. The first one will be narrow, and they'll get progressively wider as I go down. I like to use old hand planes, but electric planes are for speed. You can see the bevel on the machine, and now you can see it on the edge of the door. It's ready to hang now. I'll try it and see how it fits. Mate these hinges, put the top pin in, the bottom pin. and close it and check the margins. Well, that's pretty tight, but it looks like this hinge is sagging. There's some movements on that pin, so I'll take that out by throwing the hinge. Just a little piece of cardboard shim that came from the box that the hinges were packed in. If I take this leaf loose and put the cardboard in this position, It'll move the barrel that way, and if I were to put it over on this edge, it would move it this way. I'm going to put it behind here to close this margin up. That takes care of it. There's a dime, and there's the nickel. Thank you.